I wanted to, I'm going to talk in, in my effort to build you up, motivate you, I wanted to start by talking about failure a little bit. Um, I was, I'm from Los Angeles, I'm from a suburb of Los Angeles, um, and a not a cool suburb. And I really, I, when I was little, I really desperately wanted to be a child star, and not even really an actor. I wanted to, like, I thought about it in those terms, like child stardom. It came before anything. I didn't want to be like a thespian. And my little sister also wanted to be a child star, I think, because I wanted to be. And we would spend, like, hours and hours and hours trying to emulate famous celebrity sibling poses in the mirror. Because um, there was like, you know, there was like, we'd have all these magazines and there was a big kind of history of celebrity siblings. Or Jason and Justin Bateman were really big, and Kirk and Candace Cameron, and the Phoenixes. And um, we would just basically, uh, we didn't practice our acting very much, but we really got our poses down. And we would, uh, we had, we were, our favorite one was you kind of stand back to back and you like the two siblings and then you kind of like do like a thumbs up to the camera. We were very good at that. And this is actually, these were my head shots when I was little. Um, that's Sweet Valley High. This is orphans were really, the orphan kind of thing was really big when I was a kid. And uh, so that was like kind of a Natty Gan, Punky Brewster thing happening. Um, this is some more. I remember, I have such vivid memories of this photo shoot. Those glasses were every child, aspiring child star wore those. Not every, not every one, but if you look at any child star from that time, all, there's always the nerdy, you know, the kid in the glasses. Um, and the thing is, I, so I took all these classes, but I totally, utterly failed. Like, I got nothing. I didn't get, I didn't, not only did I not become a child star, I didn't even get, I didn't get any commercials. I didn't get any, um, like, I was never on Double Dare or anything. I didn't, I wasn't in a catalog. Like, you have to try really hard to not get into a catalog. <laughs> I, I, and nothing. And uh, I remember there was one kid from my class, her big moment was she, uh, she got it like, she was on growing pains and she silently, she didn't have a speaking part. All she had to do was Ben looked over and saw her in this play and she leaned over and winked at him and she didn't even have a line and it was so, I couldn't even get that. I couldn't even get the non-silent, non-reoccurring guest spot on a terrible sitcom. It was terrible. So then I had to, but I was, I turned out pretty good at writing. I would write these really neurotic um, monologues for my acting class. And um, my teacher began to encourage me to go in that direction. And I ended up going, I ended up, uh, I went to school in New York for writing. But I kind of like didn't know what I was doing. It was I was really young and I didn't really understand what kind of writer I wanted to be. And I um, was living in the East Village while I was in college. And um, I had this weird neighbor. This is all going to be relevant in a second. But I had this weird neighbor lady. Not weird. She probably thought she was perfectly normal. She was an older woman who was convinced I. We shared a wall. We lived in this little building in his village and we shared a wall. And she was convinced that I um, was the drug kingpin of the village. Like, ab like the top, not even just a mule, but leading the drug distribution of both the West and East Village. And she tried to frame me. Like she would do these things where she would put signs up in our building saying my apartment was number three and she'd say apartment number three selling drugs. And she would have her spot, she would stick them on the back of rave flyers, like neon. Um, rave flyers and put them around the building and then uh, she would try to plant kind of young person, what she imagined was young person trash in front of my door so that people would get mad and try to kick me out, like ding dong rappers and stuff. And she was totally obsessed with me. She was a vigilante who was obsessed with me and I didn't do, I really did not do anything. I didn't even, I didn't even smoke pot or anything. Like I was so, I'm not innocent in general but I was in this case with what she was upset about, very innocent. And um, she became obsessed with me, and I became obsessed with her, and I ended up making this little documentary about her. And I worked in a bookstore at the time, and I would kind of, after work, have people come up to, um, come back to my apartment, we'd have a barbecue on the roof, and then you could come watch the documentary and then see the live component, which was this my neighbor, who would, without fail, like she was so reliably crazy, and she would just, like, you would watch the movie, and you'd come out into the hall, and she would just be, like, shut, opening and closing the door and shining a flashlight into the hall, as though I was, 
actually putting on a professional haunted house. She was very reliable. And so then that would happen, and eventually someone at the bookstore told one of the founding producers of This American Life about this video. And he came, called me up and said, and This American Life was kind of just starting up, and he said he wanted to put me and her on the radio and do a story about it. And it was really exciting because until then, I, was do I, didn't, I had no idea really what I wanted to do. And then I met him and I heard about This American Life and it felt so, it just felt instantly familiar and instantly like the path that I wanted to take. And, and then I became an intern and a producer and now I'm one of the regular contributors and it was all kind of this trajectory forward. But what's interesting, I think, about it, and I was kind of thinking of the stories that I've done, is that a lot of it is based on something bad that was happening in my actual life that I, I'm not a really positive person, but I feel like I'm much more constructive when I'm trying to do stories about bad things that happened in my life. Because that neighbor, was, she was a total pain. But once I turned her into a story, I feel like I was able to work through something that I would not have been able to otherwise, and then it led to this awesome opportunity. And then when I started working at This American Life, the very first job, uh, story I ever did of my own was actually about being a failed child star. And I don't think I would have, if I, well, first of all, if I'd succeeded as a child star, I'd be like, I mean, I mean who knows? The, the, wor the path that would have happened would have been so much worse, probably, most likely. But it also made for a much more interesting story that I had failed instead of succeeded. And I try to, when I do stories, I don't like to just do them entirely about myself. If they're personal, I like them to try to have another component as well. And so for that one, I ended up going, finding my acting teacher from when I was a little kid. And because there was, because of this um, orphan thing that was happening, I had this memory of, we used to do this exercise in class where everybody in the class um, we would all have to kind of choose different kinds of dysfunctional children to play, and then a real therapist would come and psychoanalyze us. And in my memory, we didn't tell her that we were child, child actors. She just walked into a room of like sobbing, hair pulling out kids. And, um, and I wanted to go back and see what the kids were playing now, and there was no orphans in the group. That trend is over, it turns out. And so I ended up talking to my teacher and trying to kind of get insight into why. He didn't really tell me why I failed. I guess I wasn't cute enough or something. But um, so that's, I like to have the two things. And then um, a lot of my stories have actually been like that, where um, like I've done, my parents got divorced while I was working at the show, and I went and I did a story about their divorce. So like a thing that could have potentially been, although it was great that they got divorced, but um, a thing that could have potentially was bad in my life. I did a story about it, and then I, ex I asked my dad why he had stayed in this marriage where he was so unhappy to try to get answers, and so it is, you know, everyone says doing good stories is a cathartic experience, but I really like to try to use it as kind of, um, like, actually a way for me to find out something I would not have known otherwise if that story did not exist. Um, and then I did a story, um, what happened was my, I had this boyfriend and we, my boyfriend and I broke up, and so that was another thing that was causing me terrible pain and sadness, and so I decided to do a story about that. But at first, I, when I first broke, we first broke up, I never thought that, uh, like it wasn't my first thought. Like I don't just like have bad things happen and be like, this is how, how am I gonna turn this into gold? Like normally it's something, it has to be kind of like come from a place that seems like it's actually gonna move, um, like the story needs to exist. So with that, I was totally devastated. I did not think about it in story terms. And then something happened that kind of, um, the story kind of came into my head based on this thing that I was doing as a result of the breakup. So I'm gonna play you a bit of that story first, and it's gonna go back a little bit to explain the relationship, and we'll see what I mean. Can you play the first clip? I mean greatest. Oh. We'd pass entire evenings just complimenting each other. We took hand-holding to new heights. And we listen to hours and hours of music, teenager style, playing one song after another while smiling a lot. This is me and my ex. I don't quite remember how our Phil Collins phase began. I think it was one of those things that started off ironically, with Anthony lip syncing, adorably, to Against All Odds one night. But over time, it became less and less ironic, until one day we were actual fans. How can I just let you walk away? Just 
and he broke up with me on New Year's Eve. I told you, corny. I didn't really see it coming, and I definitely didn't want it to happen. He said, you're going to be okay. I just cried and cried. I wanted to stop it, to fix it. I searched deep inside myself for the right words to say, and out of my mouth popped this. How can you just let me walk away? I'm the only one who really knew you at all. And I meant it. In fact, I go so far as to say that in that moment, no one could have conveyed how I was feeling better than Phil Collins. If I thought I'd been in the Phil Collins phase before, it was nothing compared to what came next. I was no longer listening to his songs for pleasure, but for pain. They were breakup songs, and hearing them was the only thing that made me feel better. And by better, I mean worse. There's something so satisfying about listening to sad songs. They're like how you would actually be spending your day if you were allowed to just break down and sob and grab hold of everyone you met. They make you feel less alone with your crazy thoughts. They don't judge you. In fact, they understand you. A breakup song won't ever suggest you start online dating or that you're better off without him. They tell you that you're worse without him, which is exactly what you want to hear because it's how you feel. I didn't want to be cheered up. I didn't want to bounce back. I didn't want to meet someone new. I wanted to wallow, big time, deeply, and with the least amount of perspective possible. And the only way to do that was by turning off my phone and turning up the sad, sad music. Hi. Hi. Oh, oh can, you pa- can you... Um, okay. Uh, sorry. Anyway, so what happened, so that was the thing. So I wasn't going to do, that's what happened. I was listening to all these songs, and suddenly I realized that I would not be able to ever feel good again unless I learned how to write a breakup song of my own. And I really meant it, too. It wasn't just, I had the idea even before I told this American Life. Like, I, it was the only thing I could imagine to help my way through this. And I also have no, um... The thing is, I have no, I'm, I have no musical ability whatsoever. I don't play any instruments. I don't sing karaoke. Nothing. And so it was a huge challenge to try to figure out how I was going to have to do this thing that I had to do. There was no way that I could think it was, it was not going to happen. And so then um, I did tell This American Life about it, and they said they were on board. They would try to help me. I enrolled at first in a uh, like this adult education songwriting class. And I'm sure there's plenty of adult education classes that are fine, but this one was not. And this, the teacher, all he did was like every week he would just take out this picture. He would tell us about when, then one time he met Bruce Springsteen backstage somewhere and then just talk about it. And it wasn't even like he played with them. He met him once. And I still get emails where like that picture appears in the, in the body sometimes. And so that didn't work. And I realized that not only did I have to write a breakup song, but there was only one person that I could go to to help me learn how to write a breakup song. And that person was Phil Collins. Can you play that? Colin, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you great. In my mind, he was already so intimately involved in my breakup that it seemed crazy that he didn't actually know about it. So I told him. Well, I'm going to tell you the, I'm going to tell you the whole story of my <laughs> breakup and stuff, okay? <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's your 45 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um... Um, well, it also involves you, because so so I was dating, um, I was dating my boyfriend Anthony, yeah. and um, he kind of broke up with me mm-hmm. on New Year's Eve. Oh, nice. Whereas before it was Anthony and I talking about Phil. Now it was Phil and I talking about Anthony. Actually, pretty tidy when you think about it. And at one point, I turned to him, and I just it just flew out of my mouth. Um, just I just looked at him, and I was like, I I can't believe. You're just going to let me... Walk away. Yeah. <laughs> and before long, Phil Collins and I were commiserating about heartbreak, which he also went through recently. I mean, I've just been through a, a marriage breakup, and you talk about New Year's Eve. I mean, my divorce was final on my birthday. Oh, really? And I didn't want it at all. Um, oh. So that's something that, you know, you always remember these things, you know, like... Uh, you'll always remember New Year's Eve, and I'll always remember my birthday. I know. It makes you want to skip those days, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Up until this conversation, I never thought I had much in common with Phil Collins. He started playing in Genesis at age 19. I didn't. He performed in Live Aid, while I only watched it on TV. He was in the movie Buster, which I never actually saw. But talking to him was easy. 
He told me that when he was in Genesis, he just played drums and sang. He didn't write. Against All Odds is one of the first songs he wrote himself when he was working on his first solo album. That song particularly was written during my first divorce. Mm -hmm. My first wife and the kids had gone, and I was just left there. So it was written totally out of experience as opposed to a, this is a what-if song, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Do you think you could have written that song if you hadn't gone through, if your wife hadn't left? Uh, probably not. I mean, frankly, the, 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 if, if that personal stuff had not happened to me at that mm -hmm. time, I probably would never have made an album. And if I was to have made an album, eventually, it would have been more of a jazz rock thing, because that was what I was actually, that was my output. Apart from Genesis, I was in a band called Brand X. And, and that's, you know, I was a player. So, you know, no, without that stuff, I wouldn't have felt the things I felt that made me sit at a piano night after night, day after day, writing stuff, you know. Did it help? Um, well, it helped in as much as, I, you know, it was kind of, well, when she hears this, it's all going to be okay, you know. Mm -hmm. Really? Is that what you thought? <laughs> I did, yeah. Foolish, huh? But, I mean, I did. Okay, so I end up writing the song. I play it for Phil. He likes it. it makes me very happy. But what I like, I like, uh, I like a lot of things about this. I like that I got to talk to Phil Collins and that he was so great. But also I like that he, when I talked to him, it kind of seemed like he was doing the same thing I was, he had done the same thing I kind of believed in, which was this, you know, he felt terrible and then he turned it into something else and he wouldn't have been Phil Collins, it sounds like, if this sad stuff hadn't happened since he was going to go in a different direction creatively. And I felt really, I feel really empowered by that because I, in general, I have always just kind of had, I've just been, it's positive thinking has always been so confusing to me and hard for me to wrap my mind around. And I do feel like there's this whole, like there's a lot of times where you feel bad too. And those feelings are at, can be as, they're really strong. And I feel like there should be something that can be done with that level of emotion that can, you know, you put into feeling bad. And, um, and I actually, I call it productive dwelling. Cause I feel like I don't know how to push things down, but I also don't want to just be stuck forever in the feeling bad. And I really feel good when I can not only channel into something, but just make an entire new thing that didn't exist if, I, if this thing hadn't happened. And um, I've tried to do it in lots of things. I, I watch the show, the, I recap the show, The Walking Dead, the zombie show on AMC, because it drives me insane and I find there's so many plot holes. And I was actually so out of my mind screaming at the TV, and we don't live in the kind of times where you can just write angry letters to like, the editor. And so I tried to use Twitter at first, and that, wasn't, that did not contain my frustration enough, so then I wrote to New York Magazine, and I was like, can I please write about this show so that I can like, work through my feelings of it? I, um, this, is that. this is a thing I did. This is another heartbreak kind of thing. This is a art project called The Thing, where it's, uh, you basically you subscribe, and you get four mystery pieces of art a year. Oh, whoa. Sorry. Um, and this is a, so through this pro, uh, through this place called The Thing, I designed a cutting board, which is a, uh, it's supposed to be a heartbreak cutting board. You're supposed to cut onions on it. And uh, the whole point is that after you go through a breakup, you're, or you know something, yeah, go through a breakup, or someone moves out, your kitchen feels kind of lonely, it's hard to cook, you know, it's really hard to like start cooking for yourself or even just use that space again. So this is supposed to be, you're supposed to cut onions on it that, so that makes you cry, and then you work through the pain through crying, and then as you use it more, you cut the text away, and then hopefully the pain will fade too, and then by the end you'll be healed and your kitchen will be full of food. Um, I'm also writing a book about the self-help industry because I really don't understand that. And um, again, this is something like, it's like this whole use of positive energy. I'm really trying to understand, and so I'm writing a whole book where I try to tackle it. So my, there's another, oh yeah. My, I don't know, what I wanted to leave you guys with is um, I hope you guys feel good all the time and bad stuff does not happen to you, but if it does, maybe you can try to productive dwell your way through it next time. Thank you.